We have the Bible open up to Psalm 32. We've been talking a series of messages of how to be led by the Holy Spirit. And um, in this psalm, David has evidently messed up and then come back to God, and he's celebrating God's blessing. So let's first begin right with Psalm 32, verse 1. David says, How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. How blessed. Is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. You're not trying to con God. You see, nobody could. Well, we try to hide some things from God. Verse 1, a couple questions. Is the psalmist's sin covered? Yes, his sin was covered. You say, are, are our sins covered? No, our sins are washed away. We live under a different covenant, thank God. But even under that old covenant, it was an awesome thing for the blood of animals to cover the sins until Jesus could come. Our sins have never been covered. If you repent in that moment, the blood of Jesus obliterates your sin. Amen. Now in verse 2, it says, How blessed is the man who, to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now David's returned to God so completely and to such a degree that he's able to say, Lord, it's so wonderful to stand in your presence transparently without any deceit, without anything to try to hide from you. Amen? Amen. And then skip down to verse 5. David said, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Now, I want to throw one quick thing in here and then we're going to go out to the um, blessings of repentance. There is a grace message that says that under the new covenant, we don't have to confess our sins or repent. And yet, First John one John or First John one nine says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just. Yeah. Now listen carefully. Under the new covenant, we still repent and forsake our sins, but we do not do penance. Now there's a big difference between repenting and doing penance. When you repent, you turn 180 degrees and go the other way and say, Lord, I. Let's look at this scripture. It's in the Old Testament, but it still works. Um, Proverbs 28.13 explains this completely. It says, he who conceals his transgressions will not prosper. you got a hidden sin, you can't prosper. But he who does two things, confesses and forsakes them. You don't have to confess to people. Unless it's a sin against somebody where you've been rude and you need to apologize, things like that. But it says, he who confesses and forsakes. You don't just confess your sin, you turn around and go the other way. Amen? Yeah. He who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. So we do not do penance. That, what does that mean? If you truly repent and you're going this way and it's wrong, and you true, I do a 180 and you confess it to the Lord and you forsake that sin, you have repented. You don't have to beat yourself up for three weeks. You don't have to wait two weeks to expect to prayer, get a prayer answer. That wonderful. We, don't, we repent, but we don't have to do penance. Hallelujah. So when he says, I have forsaken my sin, David is saying, um, I can stand before you in absolute transparency. And look at verse 6 now. The blessings come. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they will not reach him. The first blessing you have when you're in the right place with God, you are inaccessible to the enemy. Verse 7. David says, you're my hiding place, you preserve me from trouble. You deliver me, with, you surround me with songs of deliverance. So what else is David saying? The first benefit is being inaccessible to the enemy. The second is hidden in God. When you are walking with God, hearing from God in the center of the perfect will of God, you are in a place where you're literally hidden from Satan's attacks. And you say, well, can you live more there and sometimes than others? Yeah, we all do. But that's the place to shoot for. Yeah. Hearing. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you're inaccessible. You're hidden. The third thing is you're preserved. David says you preserve me from trouble. And the fourth thing is, it says you surround me with songs of deliverance. The fourth benefit David says of coming back to God is victorious rejoicing. So we live in a place of victory over the enemy when we're right with God. Amen or not? Yeah. Amen. Amen. David exclaims, I'm right with God, so I'm an inaccessible, hidden, preserved, and victorious. And now, the very next verse, the Lord starts adding a promise. Look at verse 8. God speaking here. He said, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, 
whose trappings include bed and bridle to hold them in check, and otherwise they will not come near you. Now let's look at those two verses. After David celebrates the fact that he's right with God, he's inaccessible to the enemy, he's victoriously rejoicing, God steps right into the psalm and starts talking in verse 8, and he said, I'm going to instruct you and teach you the way you should go. Now, I don't know how big a promise that is to you. I love that promise. You know, Micah, there's so many things I don't know. There's things, well, it's quiet. There's so many things in the natural where you need help from God, and there's so many things in the spiritual where you need help from God. If we're right with God and not just playing games, the Lord says, I am going to instruct you and counsel you in your daily circumstances of life, in the huge decisions of life, in the little decisions of life, you face the dilemma. He said, I'm right there with you. And if you, one of the biggest things about being led by God is simply remembering to turn to him and ask him for advice. That's one of the main reasons we don't hear from, no, I mean, I'm not saying you, I'm saying me, all of us. We just forget to ask. But what we're going to talk about today is preparing our hearts to hear from God. You see... It's very easy, I used to teach mathematics, and algebra I think is a marvelous thing, but if you don't have long division, you can't do algebra. If you don't know how to reduce a fraction, you can't do algebra. So if you got kids in your algebra class that were missing basics, there was no choice but you go back and build the basics and learn how to reduce a fraction. Are you following me? Yeah. Now what we're gonna talk about today is something that every single person here can relate to mightily. If you've been walking with God for years, I'm still studying this. I love to be led of the, of the Spirit of God because He always leads you in His triumph in Christ. It says in 2 Corinthians 2 14. And if you're brand new, you can start hearing from God immediately. But one thing I realized as I was studying this, because faith preachers, we, we tend to tell people, well, if you go to buy, buy a new car, I don't know why you always use that, it's illustration. You don't want to buy the wrong car, right? Check your spirit and see what kind of witness you have in your heart. But as I was studying this week, I began to realize there's some preparation that goes into hearing from God. Okay, And that's what we're going to talk about is how do you live in a place, how do you prepare your heart and your mind to be led by the Holy Spirit? Okay, so that's where we're going. I want to show you. In verse 8, we see that God promises us to, promises to instruct us, but then in 9, he gives us a warning. He said, don't be like the horse and the mule that have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. Now, what does that mean? That means that a whole lot of Christians never pay attention to God until they are in too much misery and pain to ignore a situation. Now, I'm not saying you, but I've known some people like that. They don't have a lot of time for God until they, you know, they're in traction in the hospital looking straight up at the ceiling and they say, okay, God, you got my attention. Now, what is a bit for a horse? A bit causes pain if he doesn't go the way the rider is directing him. Okay? A really wonderful horse that has a great relationship with your rider can actually be rain trained. And a rain trained horse is where you have a halter on him, but you don't have a bit to cause him any pain because if you just pull the reins to the right, or, or to the, uh, on, you know, on, the, on the right side, he's going to feel and go this way. Just the light touch of the rein on the neck is enough for the horse because that horse wants to go where the rider wants him to go. Are you following me? A rain-trained ch uh, Christian doesn't have to live with a bit in his mouth where circumstances are constantly forcing him back to God. Yeah. Now, this is a touchy subject. But how many of you can all remember a time when you were so spiritually mature that it took wake-up calls on a continual basis, all right? Well, this is what the Lord is saying. He's saying, don't be like the horse of a mule who are dense, who have to have a bit and bridle to keep them on the track. He says, every single day, desire to be led of the Spirit of God in all your decisions. And you say, well, why wouldn't everybody do that well? One reason is that when you desire to let God lead you, he will always use you to bless people. Possibly by giving them something monetarily, but more often to encourage them. We've got, we live in a world where way too many people are going to hell. And so it is the Lord's desire to use us. If we decide to be led of the Holy Spirit, not only will he show you which car to buy so in, in which stock to buy or whatever you're praying about, but he will cause you to have such a heart of compassion that you reach out to people that don't know Jesus. Understand? Yeah. All right. 
So, today we're going to talk about preparing our hearts and minds to hear from God. From verse 8 here, we see that the Lord has promised to be faithful and instruct us in whatever we need instruction about. And you do need to know about both spiritual matters and natural matters. First step, as we saw in David's psalm, is to develop a transparency before him. It's important to always treat God with respect and to always be honest with him. If there's something that's bothering you, it's better to respectfully pour out your heart to him than to just go in and pretend you're not kicked about something. Oh boy, it's required. All right. We'll get there in a minute. But you know what? I've known people that stayed far from God just because they wouldn't be honest and say, Lord, we got to have it out here. I don't know why this person died. And I need to talk to you. And you need to have that discussion until there's peace. But if you, oh, if you have part of your heart that's hard toward God, it's going to be really hard to hear. Okay? Hallelujah. We're talking. Go to 1 Peter 1. He talks about getting your heart right. You know, this might not sound like an exciting message, but to me... As we study it, you're going to see that that place of, his, of his, where he calls you is a place where you're going to look better than you've ever looked before in your life. If you really and truly get in sync with the Holy Spirit, God will promote you and bless your life so much that you will have to cautiously remind yourself, this is nothing of me and all of him. All right? And that's the place Jesus lived and it's the place he wants you to live. 1 Peter chapter 1. Tell the person next to you, this is exciting. This is exciting. Well, even if it doesn't feel like it. <laughs> All right. Now, 1 Peter 1, he's talking about the salvation that is ours. And Peter says, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you make careful search and inquiry, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. They say, well, that's an odd scripture to go about being led of the Spirit. What I want you to see is that the prophets in the Old Testament prophesied many things that were a mystery to them. God told them everything they had to know and needed to know, but he had to keep the devil in the dark. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, if they had known, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. Those demonic spirits would never have driven the crowd to scream and crucify him if they had understood the plan of salvation that was going to destroy them and rob them of their power, right? So he had, he's not going to tell you everything. When he tells you that he's going to lead you, that doesn't mean you're going to be omniscient. And you say, how do you know? Because even the prophets here didn't know everything. They knew all that they needed to know to fulfill the plan. Okay, when you see that... You say, I don't know if I like that. That's not any, no. <laughs> God does not always tell you everything, but he always tells you at least as much as you need to know to make the right decision. Amen? Okay, verse 12. It was revealed to them, that's the Old Testament prophets, that they were not serving themselves but you in these things which now have been announced to you <clears throat> through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent to from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Well, we don't look at these verses very often. It's a little complex. But when it says it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you, they were prophesying for the benefit of generations yet to come. They did, not, they did not enjoy the new birth until after Jesus was raised from the dead. And the Bible says he went down to paradise. If you'll, we don't have time to do all this, but in, in Luke chapter 15, or 16, Jesus tells the story of Lazarus, who was a beggar and a rich man. And the rich man went to hell. He was a very cruel person. Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom. Back in the Old Testament, how do we get through all this? Anyhow, back in the Old Testament... There were two parts. To, there was no suffering in Abraham's bosom, but they couldn't go to heaven because nobody can go to heaven with sin in your heart. Okay, And so, at any rate, they were prophesying about these things. Those people got born again after Jesus was raised from the dead. He went down, preached the gospel, and led a parade to heaven, it says. It says he led captivity captive, and they all, you know, David, all the Old Testament saints got born again. Now, here's my point. These prophets were prophesying things that greatly benefit you and me. And you say, but well, how does that apply to me? When God leads you many times, he's going to ask you. He asked me to serve the next generation. My heart is for the young people. I said, well, Pastor, what about us folks? We're, your heart should be for the young people too. Because our heart is for the kingdom of God. And for the kingdom of God to go forward in the next generations, we've got to pass the baton on until we have a young generation on fire for God. Hallelujah. And so if you're going to be led of the Spirit of God, 
He, he's going to show you cool stuff like which house to buy, which job to take, which car, and you're going to promote you that way. But it is going to cost you in obedience. You say, oh, I don't like that. Well, you should. Do you know why? Because not only will you be rewarded in this life, you'll be rewarded in the next. But I just want, I'm being honest with you here today. How many of you just love to hear from God on everything you need to hear from God about? We all do. But it will cost you a heart devotion to the plan of God. Amen? Yes. Okay, that's what it says. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you and these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Do you know what that means? It means there's some things that are so precious that the angels aren't permitted. They are not our class of being. Angels were not made in the spirit in the image of God. Amen. We are so blessed. Angels aren't filled with the Holy Spirit. We're so blessed. We're created in his image. We're born of him. We have his DNA. Our father sits on the throne of the universe. We are so blessed to have someone who has come to do life with us. The Holy Spirit. And the more we get to hear from him, the better, bigger blessing, the less hassle life is. I'm in favor of that. Okay, verse 13. Now we're to the preparation. I just We're supposed to come here first, but I like those other verses. So. But you can see, right, from those verses about being led. Verse 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your heart completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, what is the therefore, therefore? It, it's always a good question. It, you have to go back to the last verse to figure out the therefore, right? The therefore means that just as the Old Testament prophets serve coming generations, if we would hear our assignment from God, we must prepare our minds for action and be willing to serve the people around us and the generation to come. This, this church, this, that's what the plan for your life is about. It's so interesting as a pastor. There are a few words that I can throw out there and mean them. And I, everybody comes to life. I get everybody's attention just like this. One of them's destiny. Wouldn't you like to be in the center of the will of your God life? And would you like to come to the end of your road knowing that you have fulfilled your destiny? And when I say that, there's the sparks. Sparks and you say, oh, yeah, how many of you are going to know? Well, here's the bad thing about destiny. Nobody on the earth fulfills their destiny unless they want to more than they want the air that they breathe. Now, I'm not saying God's going to send you to Africa or Panama, but let's use the cooks that were coming Wednesday as, as an example. They didn't wake up in Panama. That was their destiny to be in Panama. It was their destiny to change a nation. They have changed a nation. I mean, they have gone up into the dairy and jungle where nobody else had been. All the witch doctors. And they would, they would plant a church in one, in one town. And when that one got established, they would put a pastor over it and go into the next death of place. They changed. I, I, the first time I ever heard of them was back in about 1996. The Lord had spoken to them that um, the only, they didn't have any, nobody had TVs, obviously, but the only thing they had were these little tiny transistor radios, and there was one government station. And the Lord spoke to Dennis that if they could get their own station, every Indian, every, I think, not the Aquas, but the, whoever, whatever Indians live in the Darien jungle, they could listen to it if they just had a Christian station. So they sent out a letter to the Ray McGrath's, would you be willing? I got so excited. I love the Latin American people. Y'all have known that. And I said, Gordon, we got to give these people $100. And he looked, okay, we don't. <laughs> but we did. Because it was the most awesome idea. And here's what they did. For one hour, they would have someone preach and explain the gospel. The next hour, they'd have music. Then they would have the word read aloud, just the Ephesians, Galatians, book after book read aloud where they could, they could hear, because most of them couldn't read anyhow if they had had it in their own language. And then they'd go back to preaching. And then... 24-7, those, those wonderful Indian people could listen and they were delivered. These people have changed a nation, okay? But you have to understand that they didn't wake up and say, oh, we just woke up in our destiny. No, to, it's okay that I talk to you about this, all right? Yeah. To walk out your destiny and to fulfill your destiny, you want to have to please God from the get-go. 
and you don't tell them which continent your destiny is on or which area of ministry your destiny is, you just say, here I am, the servant of the Lord. How would you like to use me? And when it becomes important enough for you to seek the will of God, then you start, I'm not talking down to you, am I? No. Because you see, I know so many of you, I watch you being led in the Holy Spirit. How many of you at one time or another, you know God led you to do something. It turned out really good. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not saying you aren't already being led of the Holy Spirit. I'm teaching on this to encourage you to develop this desire and mindset. And what this verse says is to prepare our minds for it. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. One of the ways I prepare my mind to do the will of God is reading these biographies that I recommended that I was so excited about, God's Generals. I'm reading one on Jad, Jad, Adoniram Judson. I had never heard of this man before. Tremendous missionary, the first missionary to Burma, or what is now, what, Myanmar? I, what is Burma? Myanmar, Myanmar, I don't know how to say it. And I mean, the, the sacrifices, and you say, well, why would you read that story? Well, this is a secret, but sometimes I think I make a sacrifice for the church, and I read them, I really like your place. Oh my God! I mean, yeah. okay, Dennis and Jeannie. I don't know how much they're going to tell you. One night she woke up and a mother rat had laid rats in her hair. <laughs> and this is what I said: I will never, as long as I live, complain about anything. I promise you, if you let me stay in Colonial Beach, I will never complain. <laughs> But he was on the ship with his new wife to go across to India and then on to Burma. And the Lord showed him in the scriptures that baptism is always associated with believing and it should be done by immersion. And he started to share that with his wife. And they just got excited. But the problem is they're sent out by the Congregationalists. If they acknowledge this truth, they will lose 100% of their support back home. This was when you didn't get on a Facebook and ask for support, all right? This is 1700s, early 1800s. And he said, well, honey, we got to follow the truth if we're going to lead a whole nation. You know, they got a whole nation to teach them the truth. They found in India, Baptists got baptized, lost every bit of support they had from the congregational church. They were out there with nothing and God supplied them. Now, I, that's the kind of courage I want to inspire yeah. to. When I prepare my mind, I read this word, I get in the presence first thing in the morning and say, Lord, I am so excited about this adventure, no matter how scary it is. I don't do this for a week, and I come back and I say, what? I have to talk in front of people? Are you kidding me? It blows me away. But I prepare my mind. If you're going to follow God and be willing and ready to be led of the Holy Spirit, You'll be a lot closer to the target if you prepare your mind. All right? Well, it's not better hurry yet. And then um, we'll get to how to do that in a minute. Look at verse 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the lust, former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because as it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Part of preparing yourself to hear from God is living right. Now I can, hey, we're being honest here today, okay? Mm -hmm. I can understand a whole lot of people saying, well, I should be able to hear from God about which car to buy or which house to buy or whether or not to take a certain trip without living right. Here's the problem. Anytime you go to do something you know is against the word of God and against the will of God, and you feel the Holy Spirit. Have you ever, you don't have to look, look innocent, or look innocent, don't look innocent. Look innocent. But have you ever been tempted to do something wrong and you thought about it and you think, well, what's it going to hurt this time? And it's just like somebody inside you. Go, Holy Spirit saying, uh uh, not a good idea. How many of you have ever held the Holy Spirit saying, not a good idea? Now, most of the time, thank God, we listen to that and we yield and we keep a tender heart. But in order to sin that sin, you have to brush him off and harden your heart. And if you continually harden your heart, you get to where when you want to hear from God, you can't. So one of the ways you, pre one of the ways you keep your heart ready, look, it says, oh, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the holy, or to the former lust in verse 14. This says, be holy. If you're going to 
walk close enough to God to hear from Him when you really want to hear from Him, you got to have a tender heart. Now that is not just obedience, it is obedience. But let me show you Psalms 95, 6 to 8, just so you know this is confirmed otherwise in Scripture. Psalm 95 says, Come, let us worship and bow down, let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Then it says, Today, if you would hear His voice, what should you do? Don't harden your hearts. As in Moribah in the day of will, as, in, as in the day of Massa in the wilderness. Now, to sin is one way to harden your heart. Another way is if the Lord has you ever no, everybody look in a second. This is a pitch upshot. Okay, everybody let's smile. Look in a second. Have you ever had God say, Okay, I put up with this long enough. Time to go now. He never makes you turn change everything at once. It would just kill us. Have you noticed that? But maybe you've been using one word in your vocabulary is just kind of crass and God didn't like it. And he kind of says God didn't like it, that you don't care too much. And then one day he says, Okay. Time for that to go. Mm -hmm. Time to get rid of that channel on TV. Yeah. Now, if you refuse to do that, you harden your heart. That's one way to harden your heart. Sin. I mean, just, just to, every time God deals with us, we have an, the option of saying, yes, sir. The other way is to not forgive. To refusing, to refusing to let the past go. Refusing to extend to others the great mercy and forgiveness. That will actually affect your ability to hear from God. Because, oh, it gets quiet when you talk about forgiveness. You see, now I just want to camp here for the rest of the day, right? I don't care what anybody ever did to you. It's not as bad as what you did to Jesus. I don't care what mercy you have to extend to anybody. It's not as great a mercy as he has extended yeah. to you. And the Bible clearly says in many places that if you will not forgive, you will not be forgiven. And you say, well, Pastor, does that mean you don't go to heaven? I don't want to find out. Let's just forgive. I don't know. All right? But I do know one thing. When I'm mad, I don't hear from God. If you've got a hard heart, I don't care who you're mad at. You can be mad at a TV preacher. Just forgive him. Let God take care of him. But here, okay, so here's three things you could do to harden your heart. Not, not repent when the Lord calls on you to repent. Refuse to forgive. And the other one is just not walking in the kindness toward God and man. One, you know, God is so kind. The kinder you are toward people, the kinder you let God be toward you. The more soft your heart is. And then I, I noted one other thing in my notes. One key to hearing from God is to not take it out on God when the enemy has managed to get his what? Swag. Every single person here, the enemy's gotten away with something we don't understand. I mean, how many of you have had prayer that you don't know how the devil got away with it? You don't know. But you've got to give God the benefit of, benefit of the doubt. Joel 2, 25, the Lord said, I'll make up to you for the years the locusts have eaten. So always, always, always know if you walk close to God, he will be a God of restoration. Okay? Now, we're going to ask ourselves two questions. Why would you want to fulfill God's perfect plan for your life, and how do you go about doing it? Let's go to Jeremiah 29. This is all sort of like background on how to be led in the Holy Spirit. Because in order to be led, we said something a couple of weeks ago, the biggest truth judgment you will ever make is about God, the kindness of God's heart toward you. If he asks you, I, don't, I think you can smoke and go to heaven. I'm not against smoking. I am against smoking, but I'm not saying it does any help. Okay. But if he asks you to give up cigarettes, it's not because he don't like you. It's because he wants you healthier, richer, less. Are you following me? Well, every other thing God has ever asked from you has been asked from a heart of love. It, it is easy to obey somebody when you're absolutely convinced they're crazy about you and would never hurt to do anything to hurt you. You've got to, before you get... Because when, when push comes to shove and when you make an instant decision on something and you hear from God, don't do it, you've got to know at that moment he's got your best interest in heart. Now, the Lord is speaking in this passage to the children of Israel or Judah that have gone into Babylon. Remember when Daniel and they all went, were taken away because of the sins of the fathers. Now he's speaking to the, the Jews left in Babylon. And he says, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its bed behalf. For in its welfare, you will have welfare. 
And then let's skip to um, verse 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, that's how long Jeremiah had prophesied that they'd be there, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you and to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans, read this with me, everybody knows this verse. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. First of all, I'd like to say that this applies to you if you're 60-something as much as it does if you're a teenager. I'm, I'm telling you, if he, God has you breathing air on this planet, he's got good plans for you. Yeah, yeah. The plans have not run out. For I know the plans that I have for you, plans for shalom. The word in Hebrew is shalom. That means absolute well-being, joy, prosperity. Now, if God asks of you something that is different than what you thought was the plan, I mean, you know what I want to be? I want to be a travel agent. Back when travel agents were travel agents. There was no internet. I want to be a travel agent. And he said, you're unhappy? No, I'm happy. Really happy. Now let me tell you something about God. He designed the destiny before he designed you. He didn't watch you pop out of your mama's womb and say, well, look at that one. That's cute. I wonder what we'll do with this one. And look at Jesus and say, what should we do with this one? <laughs> No, before you were conceived in your mama's womb, he had a plan and a destiny and a purpose for you. And when he created you, he put all the DNA, all the abilities, all the sensitivities, all, all everything you need to fulfill. And if there's something missing, the Holy Spirit will make it up. Yeah. If you'll walk with him. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. So somehow you've got to feed your faith in this word to know if God's asking me to change, it's going to be better than where I'm at. I was so scared when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're speaking in tongues. And the only reason, and you said, why do you believe that? Well, I studied it until I be. How many of you had come in here and didn't know a thing about it and you're filled with the Holy Spirit now? Just, just like this whole bunch of people. Okay, and how many of you would say your lives are better off? How many of you say your lives are worse off? Be honest. I don't see any hands. Now, you see, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you think that's funny. And it is funny. Because being filled with the Holy Spirit is one of the best things that will ever happen to you. It's the second best thing that will ever happen to you. First is getting saved, and the second is getting the whole, receiving the Holy Spirit. And I don't remember where we were. The glory. Okay. Here's what, how the devil works. It is the Holy Spirit's job to keep your life straight on track. And it's the devil's purpose to talk you out of it. All right? When you were going to get saved, the devil sat on your shoulder and told you how lame Christians were. <laughs> how it would hurt your reputation and fun and Friday nights if you got saved. And he sat on your shoulder and told you how rotten Christians had it. And when you got saved, you found out the whole thing was a lie. Yeah. You had joy and peace. When you got filled with the Holy Spirit, he did the same thing. Some of you are today. You, or the devil says, you don't want the Holy Spirit. My goodness, you're speaking a language you don't understand. And he'll, he'll fight you tooth and nail, but as soon as you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you think, this is the most wonderful thing. Life is easier. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, every time you ever choose God, you're going to have two voices. You're going to have God the Holy Spirit encouraging you to choose right. And you're going to have the devil telling you what a lame idea it is. All right? And you say, well, how in the world do I choose right? Well, we're going to talk now. What do you do to keep your heart in a place? You, you feed on this word to where you understand, number one, God's got an exact, precise, awesome plan. It may differ from your plan, but it's better. Don't be insulted. He's, hallelujah. I found this, Proverbs 10.29. I never saw this scripture. I never realized it in this context before. Proverbs 10.29 says, the way of the Lord is a stronghold to the upright, but ruin to the workers of the iniquity. Well, you know, you can take that in many ways, the first half of that verse. The way of the Lord is a stronghold. The way of love is a stronghold. Walking in love is a stronghold. You walk in love, you're invincible. Now, they may try to get a few spots in, but you keep walking in love, God will defend you. The way of the Lord is a stronghold. This is what I've found. If I can be at the right place at the right time, doing what God asked me to do, there's only blessing. There's no auto, okay? It's just blessing. Okay? 
Now, how do we prepare our hearts to hear from God? Number one, you study his word because the Holy Spirit will lead you in line with his word. And he said, you brought me to church to tell me to read my Bible? Yeah. <laughs> now, listen carefully, please. Reverend Keith Moore is one of the greatest preachers I know. He said that when he was a young person, he was draped across the altar one night after service saying, Oh, God, speak to me. And he kept praying that one word. Speak to me. Finally, God said, why should I speak to you when you don't even know what I've already said in my word? And Keith thought, well, that makes sense. And he went home and read the Bible for a while. I'll tell you what, I hear from God today in a way I didn't before I read the Bible. And you say, but I want to hear from God. You will. You will. Every word here was written to you. Read the Psalms in the New Testament to begin with. Let God speak to you. The first time I ever heard the voice of God, and you know, I have one page of notes here. We probably won't have time of it. If you don't believe God speaks to people, start reading the Bible. Yeah. There was an ark built because God spoke to Noah. I mean, Abram's, the whole nation of the Jews started because God spoke to Abram. God speaks to people. Amen. But the first way I ever heard the Lord speak to me was he would say, Denise, doesn't my word say? But he never said that to me until I started hiding his word in my heart. I, oh, yeah. discipline, don't we love that word, discipline. But when you start memorizing scriptures, the, the Lord Jesus said that when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll, he'll, he'll show you things to come, but he'll also remind you of what I've spoken to you. He'll bring that to your memory. Well, he can only bring back to your memory. You see, he was talking to the disciples who lived with him for three and a half years. They had heard a lot of Jesus sayings, right? And so the Holy Spirit came to remind them of what Jesus had said. We do not have the luxury of spending three and a half years with Jesus in the flesh. But he did leave us his word. Yeah. If you want to be led of the Spirit and you want to prepare your heart, take time in the word of God every single day. Now, I knew that would get cheers, but it's the truth. <laughs> now, listen to this. It's very scary for you to try to start hearing voices without knowing the word because you, don't, you can't test the spirits unless you know what the Bible says. The Holy Spirit will never guide you contrary to the word or lead you to violate his explicit instructions. So number one, you study his word to have a base of understanding of what he likes, what he thinks, what his principles are, what he hates. The second reason you study this word is you get to know his voice. When I first started to hear the word, he would always quote the scripture to me. He says, doesn't my word say it? It would bring me peace or wisdom. But I'm, I'm, I can't get into the whole story, but I was at my aunt's 101st birthday party. And she was lost, lost, lost. And this woman came in, and Andy said, well, I just want to die. I don't know how I get. It's not a story. It's a great story, but these people have heard it like 20 times. That's when, that's when I realized. Hey, I've been intensely in the Word of God. Never heard God speak to me except quoting Scripture. But as I'm sitting there on the bed at our 101st birthday party, the daughter of her friend, I mean, all your friends are dead. When you're 101, you don't have friends. You just have daughters of friends. The daughter of her friend who's 80 walks in, and says, how are you doing? She says, well, I just want to die. And she says, well, I've heard that if you can remember what you've forgotten to do and do it, you get to die. One woman forgot the laundry. But she took the laundry down and came in and died. And they were laughing. And they thought, and it's, I'm 22. Can you imagine? This was funny. <laughs> that moment, sad as it is, I was not worried about her salvation, but somebody else was. And I've been putting enough time in the Word that i got to know His voice. You see, the Holy Spirit wrote Genesis through Moses. The Holy Spirit wrote Exodus through Moses. The Holy Spirit wrote Number. You will hear different people, men's voices, but if you'll listen carefully, you will hear the Holy Spirit's voice. Yeah. If you call your wife tomorrow and say, hello, this is William, there's something wrong with your marriage. <laughs> How many of you, Larry, do you call Sue and say, hello, this is Larry? <laughs> No, I mean, you don't mind me picking. You do? <laughs> you just ruined my whole sermon. <laughs> Is there anybody here that you know each other so well you just start talking? Okay, I gotta read this up. <laughs> how long have y'all been married? How, about, how long have y'all been married? Fifty-three years. <laughs> That's okay, pretty soon. Pretty soon, she's gonna know your voice. You want to know? <laughs> How 
many of you have a few people in your life that if they speak, you know, okay, I remember I was at the credit union once, when Lisa came out of her office, she said, I heard my shepherd's voice. <laughs> you know, that way I, you know my voice, I talk a lot. You know All those things. If you listen to his voice in the Psalms and you memorize his word and you, you, when the Lord speaks, you know. Okay, so I'm sitting on my aunt's bed and I wasn't worried about her salvation. I was just thinking this was a hilarious conversation I've ever heard and the Lord spoke to me. And he said, you know exactly what she's forgotten to do. When you get home, write her a letter. He did not tell me to have a shouting match. She was told stone deaf. She, he did not tell me to tell her right then. When you get home, tell her. Now this is how slow we are. We, how many of you here are willing to obey the Lord? We all put two, two hands up. Absolutely. I had just spent a year, a year, eight, nine months of intensive study. Any minute I wasn't working up in the Bible. I love God. And I went back home to Massachusetts, and then we went straight to our cottage in Maine, and I never wrote the letter. And you say, duh, yeah, duh. Do you know why? Because this is how proud we are. My grandmother had witnessed to her her whole life. That woman was alive because of my grandmother's prayer. She didn't have any other relatives than my grandmother, and she kept Annie. I have a campion, you'll meet her in heaven. She kept her alive with her faith, and she's 101 years old. God told me to write the letter, and I went home and never wrote the letter. And I'm not proud to tell you this, but this was an epiphany to me when I finally got it. I was on the beach in Maine, walking my little dog at night. It was safe, and it was beautiful, and God spoke to me. And he said, when are you going to write the letter? It's the only time I've ever heard him shout in my whole life. When? And I said, I don't know what to say. He said, get back to the cottage, I'll dictate. That's, I mean, he talked to me. Now, this is a voice I come to know. Back, I said, Mom, you got some stationery? I went in the other room, and in huge block letters, I wrote out, Auntie, I know what you've forgotten to do. You've forgotten to ask Jesus in your heart. He wants you to take you to heaven, but you've got sin in your heart. You've got to ask Jesus. Big breath. And I, this is how proud we are. I put the stamp on it. I think it was a nickel stamp in the 70s. It was a little bit of postage. And I thought, that's not worth the nickel. Her heart had been so hard for so long. I thought I knew better than God. The God said, write the letter. A couple weeks later, because everything moved real slow back then, my grandma called crying and said, oh, honey, thank you, thank you, thank you. I said, what, why? And I, was, I almost forgot about it. I had zero faith that that letter was going to do anything that my grandma could have done in 80 years of witnessing to her. And she said, oh, I went to the nursing home, and your letter has tears all over it. And she handed it to me and said, would you read this to me? I think it's from Denise. And I read it, and she confessed her sins, and she wept, and she got born again. Later, she had nightmares that people were, uh, uh, the nurses were, and I said, Grandma, those are demons. Tell her to use the name of Jesus, and the name of Jesus worked for her just like that. She's born again. Yeah. Now, let me tell you something. I don't tell that story with pride at all. That's embarrassing. That's embarrassing to think that God Almighty would speak to me in such a way that I heard him word for word to word, write her a letter and tell her what she forgot to do. And he had to track me down on a beach and yell and say, why not? But you know what? It did something for me. It was an epiphany for me. And I went home in, a, in my bedroom. I took a you know, butcher paper, you know, big white paper, and I put in letters this big, exactly what Mary said in John chapter 2 at the wedding he, she said, whatever he says to you, do it. I wasn't saying doing that to impress God. I was out of impressing God. I figured at that moment God was not impressed. Yeah. All right? <laughs> God! I thought it wasn't worth the nickel stamp, and she's in heaven at this moment as we speak. I put it in letters this big. Whatever he says to you, do it! Yeah. And so, where before I get off work and I want to go shopping, every, you know, because I was single and had money and living at home and the Lord <laughs> you know there's nothing about being like being honest is there <laughs> and the Lord say I want you to go home and study my word this afternoon it used to be I said oh I just know they're having a great sick no fine I no listen I found a place in God where I was happy to obey happy to obey when it comes to our plans for Thanksgiving, I just say, God, what's the plan? And it, you know, yeah. and you say, why would you want to do that? Because I like his plans. Yeah. I like his thoughts. I like the fact that he knows everything. I like the fact that he doesn't direct you into traffic jams. I like the fact that he gives you wisdom and anointing and a calling. And what happens is you get so 
spoiled being in the center of the will of God, that when you get out, you realize it and you say, I don't like this one bit. Help me back into it. Yeah. And when you study the word, you hear the Lord's voice. And when you hear someone's voice enough, it becomes distinctive to you. And you recognize their voice. Way before scientists told us that each of us have our own unique voice print, we knew that. We know the voices of the people we love. If you love him enough to get in this word, you will come a time when you will know his voice, and it's the best thing in the world. Go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Let's just, I'm not going to read them in order. Let's read 7 and 8. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't hear them. What does that mean, the sheep didn't hear them? You ever heard of teaching? Anything? Look. It, it just was strange. You knew in your heart. How many of you ever heard of teaching? You said, that ain't right. But yeah, that's, that is the witness of the Holy Spirit. Okay? But now look it up in verse 2. It says, he who enters by the door is the, door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, then the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. How many believe Jesus told the truth? That means that when somebody's up here, whether it's Al Fury or, or whoever comes through, and they're speaking the truth, it bears so much witness to your heart because you're not just hearing it with these ears. In your heart, the Holy Spirit is saying, yeah, that's the truth. If I preach and there's no anointing and authority on it, you shouldn't come back. The only reason you come back is because the Holy Spirit said, yeah, that's the truth. I'm seconding that. All right? So if you can know that here, you can know that in your everyday life when he speaks. Um, look at verse 5. A stranger they simply will not follow but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. I want to give you a tip right now. Confess that. Just say, I'm never going to be led astray by, uh, by a false voice. I don't know the voice of strangers. And then just say, I know my shepherd's voice. I know my daddy's voice. So, we need to wrap this up. If it's your purpose to be led by the Lord in day-to-day -day life. Just, I know I spent a long time telling that story, but how many of you know that you can love to do the will of God more than you love to do the will of God right now? Yeah. Okay? I honestly love to do the will of God more today than I did a year ago. You say, why? Because it always works. Yeah. Look at, do you have that scripture in Isaiah 47 or 48, Isaiah 48? He says, I'm the Lord who teaches you to profit. He will never lead you to a lemon car. He will never lead you to the wrong mate. He will Thus says the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you in the ways you should go. And then the next verse he says, if you just paid attention to my commandments, your well-being would have been like a river and your righteousness like the ways of the sea. I'm here as a testimony, to give testimony, as a witness, that the more you're willing to be led in the Holy Spirit of God, the more shalom there is in your life. The less stress, the, the easier schedules go. Is that good? Yes. And it, it's a good reason. So wrapping this up, if it's your purpose to be led by the Holy Spirit, or it's Holy Spirit day by day, number one, you read the word just to find out how he thinks. Number two, you read the word to become familiar with his life, or with his voice. Number three, you determine to live a life that pleases him. You, you, you've got to be sweet to people to hear from God. you got to be. It's the truth. I'm going to share with you what the Lord shared. I, a lot of you were here the night it happened, but when Al Fury was here. When you obey God, God jumps right in with you and lifts you up. I want to show you something. And the Lord showed me this one night. I was trying to fall asleep, and I was kind of praying over what we could give him. And do you know that when, when people come through here, God cares that we bless them. These people have given their lives. God cares that we help them. You, there are tremendous, horrible stories of people that go and they preach. They don't get any offering out however they expect it to live, right? So anyhow, night before Wednesday, the last, the last what I thought was the last night of the crusade last month, um, I was falling asleep, and I couldn't fall asleep. And the Lord said, if you ever get stingy with your guest ministers, you won't have this magnificent love that's over the church. You'll have a level of love, but not this magnificent love. And... I thought, I wonder how that works. That doesn't make sense, does it? If we ever get stingy. And he said, well, you know, have you ever seen 
a couple start out, and they're not really even mad at each other. One person says something, and the other one takes it wrong. They didn't say it exactly right. The other one takes it wrong. And the other one says, well, yeah, 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 yeah. And the demons just start jumping on. Have you ever seen something? I'm sure you've never experienced it, but you've seen it. <laughs> now, we have a name for that. It's called a vicious circle. Have you ever seen a vicious circle when things just get ground down into the ground because there's demonic hell? And they end up getting a divorce because of the way the toothpaste was squeezed or something. It's just stupid, stupid, stupid. You start that, you stop that by not being willing to fight. Now listen, this is what the Lord said. He said, there is, okay, everybody go like this. You know a vicious circle? Now go like this. He says, there is an upward. You don't have a name for it in English. We don't even have a comprehension. But where you do something good... And it's where a devil would drive a bad word into the ground. I just lift you up. He says, you've been so good to so many people. You bring in the bus kids and you love on them. They're our own family. You bring in the guest speakers and you bless them all you can. He said, every single time you do something out of agape love, I just jump in and like a demon would take it down, I just pick it up. Yeah. You know, and I use this example. If we're in Fredericksburg, we see each other. We, if I saw you in Fredericksburg, right? I wouldn't go like this and go, hey, you know? And everybody says, what, what did you see him last? Two days ago we saw him last, but you know. <laughs> we love each other in this church. But do you know why? It's because we've been good to people. Now listen, you say, where in the world does this have to be led of the Spirit? I'm telling you, when you are kind to people and you keep a tender heart, God is right there with you. God will... Come on. Do you understand? It matters how you treat people. Yeah. It matters that you're good to the little girl that checks you out at the grocery store. Yeah. Yeah. Look at Ephesians 4.32. We need a tender heart. It says, be kind to one another. Tender hearted. Forgiving. Just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. If I wanted to hear from God more, I would put that right up to the whatever it says to you. Do it sign. And I said, be kind. Be kind. The person that you live with is having a bad moment. You don't even know if you've lived with them. Why all the reasons are that moment. Be, be kind. Hallelujah. <laughs> even if you're living with somebody, they might be having a bad moment. You don't know why they're having it. We think that if we live with somebody, we know everything they're going through. No, you don't. No, you don't. Be kind. Now, I, we don't have time to go through everything, but I'll, I will tell you this. In the long run, the basic way God leads you is through the witness of your spirit. Sometimes he speaks. Like that day, I'm telling you, I heard from God. I don't try to ever say God told me unless God, I know God told me. Most of the time, 98% of the time, it's by the witness of my heart. Colossians 3.15 says, let peace rule in your heart. And the, the scripture I was going to take to you on this, do you remember in Luke chapter 2? where Jesus has been born, he's been circumcised, now they're going to dedicate him. And as they walked into the temple, a prophet of God, a dear old man of God, Simeon. Well, let's read this first. Read this with me. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. That is the rule of making a decision. If you don't have peace about something, wait. All right? Peace rules. But if you go to Luke chapter 2, where Simeon... He just takes Jesus into his arms and starts prophesying. You know, you have to ask. It says, when the days for the purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So the Lord had shown him these things. Now look what happens. He came in the Spirit. Was he prepared? Have you ever come to the church out of the Spirit? Yes. Okay. He came in the Spirit to the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, he took him in his arms and blessed him and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you're releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. And he declares this child. Nothing about this baby looks any different than any other baby. Now, my question to you is, did Simeon hear thunder from the sky that told him this was the baby? No. How did he know that the one Mary carried 
was Messiah and he could die. You see, why did he say he could die? Because that was his life's assignment, to pray that baby in. Yeah. The promises were there, but somebody's got to take that promise into God. That was his life's assignment. We pray that baby. He said, you know how he knew? He knew by the wonderful witness of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Amen. And if, if you tell me, Pastor, I don't hear from God, are you sure? I'm sure you've heard from God. How many of you know this is your home church? Not, I bet you not one of you saw it written in the sky, you know? A sky writer. Go to new life, you know? No. You know the rightness. Everybody say rightness. Peace. Lightness. You ever see that witness? Anna, we don't have time to read, but another lady. Do you want to read this one too? God can talk to people. Say that. God can talk to people. Tell the person next to you, God can talk to you. And then say, God can talk to me. But most of the time, he doesn't write it in the sky and he doesn't thunder it. It's by the witness of the Spirit. Look at this. And, um, do we have those other verses in Luke 2 about Anna? I'm not sure which verses it was. There was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then as a widow to the age of 84, she never left the temple serving night and day with fastings and prayers. But she has seen a lot of babies. A lot, a lot of babies came through there to get dedicated. At that very moment, she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak of him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Israel. Glory to God. What I wanted to say to you, and I got to look at all those scriptures. God talked to them. God talked. We could be here all day reading places where it says and God spoke to somebody. God talks. Psalm 115 says the trouble with idols is they have mouths, but they can't talk. If you ever tell say that God can't talk, you're sick, you're taking the power away from your God. Because it says he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast in Psalm 33. When I've tried to help you understand, Psalm, Romans 8, 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. If you're a child of God, that's Romans 8, 14. If you're a child of God, you can expect God to lead you in every area. About doctrine, about what you believe in the Bible, about what music to listen to, what preachers to listen to, and also about natural things. God wants to, and then it also, when, I know I always say one last verse, I think this is the last verse. Romans 8, 16, it says, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. The, the New King James says the Spirit himself bears witness. You have a witness in your heart right now that the, what we're saying is true. How many of you have a witness in your heart that you're going to heaven? If you die, it's cool, I'm going to heaven. That witness is what we need to develop an awareness of. And what I tried to do today is to back off a little bit and help you understand how you prepare your heart to live sensitive to the witness of the Holy Spirit about every matter of life, spiritual and natural. Read the Word. Tell Him how much you love to obey Him. Keep a tender heart toward people. Be good to people. And I'm not saying that's an exhaustive list, but it'll get you on your way, okay? God bless you. Let's see.